Erie, Pennsylvania doesn't see a lot of crime. But for two years, one bizarre atrocity has been preying on the city's mind. I wish I knew who did that. I'd turn him in and get the reward money. This, by any standards, was an act of terror, but with a particularly homegrown flavor. I don't know who done it. Sure hope they find him. It was a plot from the twilight zone of American crime. Strangest thing I've ever heard of. It's really, really crazy. The guy had a bomb around his neck. A pizza delivery man walked into a bank with a bomb strapped around his neck. He robbed it and walked out. He was held by police and then blew up. Was this a robbery gone wrong or a sadistic public execution? around 2.30 this afternoon when this man entered the PNC Bank on Peach Street. He gave the teller a note demanding money and saying he had a bomb strapped to his body. After collecting money, the suspect walked out. A number of customers followed him and called police. Troopers dropped the suspect to the ground and backed away. They called the Erie Bomb Squad. But before the bomb squad could arrive, the device strapped to the man's body exploded. These are the FBI pictures of the collar that held the bomb in place and the locking mechanism that held the bomb on. Somebody out there in Erie was playing a game with Brian Wells' life and then they took it. This is the strangest unsolved crime in America today. But who was Brian Wells? Was he a natural-born bomber? First off, I went to see his landlady and her brother. Well, he was really, um, really quiet. Like, in the morning, he'd get up and usually he would go to McDonald's or someplace and get his breakfast and uh, maybe the newspaper, and he'd come home and mess around until it was time to go to work. And he was a nice guy. He did things to help people. So 46-year-old Brian seems to have been one of Erie's ordinary people. A quiet, middle-aged man with simple tastes. When the police blew his front door down when they raided his cottage, they found no evidence of bomb-making inside. So you don't think he was a, a natural-born terrorist bank robber? <laughs> <laughs> no, no you, you wouldn't consider him at all in, the, in a terrorist mode at all. He, he's just a really uh, laid-back, nice guy. But perhaps Brian was perfect for this crime. Meek and trusting, he was an obvious fall guy. He was a small man, and uh, he would have been easy to subdue. I can see why. Maybe somebody knew him well enough to um, pick that particular pizza shop. If anything, that would be the only way he would have been involved that I could see. So what was it like for Brian on the last pizza delivery of his life? I want to find out, to retrace his route, beginning at Mamma Mia's Pizza, where Brian worked, and driving in a car just like the one Brian drove on that dreadful day. It was just before 2 o'clock in the afternoon when the phone call ordering two small pepperoni and sausage pizzas came in. It was a muffled voice and the owner of the pizza shop couldn't understand the directions that were being given. Brian took over the phone, it was near the end of his shift, got the directions which were to go up Peach Street, which is where I'm driving right now, at exactly the same time of day, two o'clock. His instructions were to go up Peach Street and then turn off down a dirt road. Brian 
Flynn thought he was delivering pizzas to workmen at these TV towers. Someone else had different plans. Brian Wells finds himself in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by a whole load of satellite dishes. Then one, maybe more people come at him and his nightmare begins. They clamp a bomb around his neck. He's handed a homemade shotgun disguised as a walking stick. They put a T-shirt on him to hide the bomb. And Brian is left reading a note. It says, bomb hostage. You are to go to a PNC bank at Summit Town Centre on Peach Street. Quietly give the following demand notes to a receptionist or bank manager. Do not cause alarm. Get required money and deliver to a specified location by following notes that you will collect as you race against time. Each note leads to the next note and key until you've finished. You will collect several keys and a combination to remove the bomb. Most important rule, do not radio phone or contact anyone. Alerting authorities, your company or anybody else will bring your death. This man is terrified. He does know, according to the instructions, that he's got to go and rob a bank with a bomb and a walking stick gun. Brian Wells then appeared at the PNC bank at the local mall, parked, went in, wearing his bomb and carrying his little cane gun. He was in for just a few minutes before he emerged with a bin liner with only $4,000 and then set off on the next part of his little journey. Which was just a couple of hundred yards. Brian had to drive to the McDonald's sign, stop and pick up his next instructions, hidden under a rock. So this is where he finds this note, and this says, leave McDonald's from the rear and drive round behind the side of Eyeglass World, which is up there. You must get out and tie the orange tape around the fire hydrant at Peach Street to signal that you have the money and left the bank. Brian Wells never made it that far. He was stopped right here by the state police, front and back. These police officers approached him, they got him out of the car, they handcuffed him, and then he admitted that he had a bomb on him. So they forced him back onto the floor and backed off. And the clock kept ticking. And Brian died. I got a phone call approximately about 3.40 saying that there was a man laying on the middle of Peach Street. And then I got another phone call directly after that saying that there might have been a bomb-related incident. So I dispatched uh, Janet, our photographer, one of our shooters, up to the scene. She got there to find um, Brian on the ground with the uh, Erie Bomb Squad trying to find out what was going on. On my immediate left is Special Agent Bob Rudge. The police put on a confident uh, face for the press. And on my right is District Attorney Brad Falk, the District Attorney for here in Erie County. Task force members have literally been working around the clock on this case. They're continuing to, to do an outstanding job. As far but as there was little progress on the ground. Getting information from the public. Here, the FBI uh, had two composite drawings of individuals they were looking for, scenes running from them near the mall. The truth is, this came, to, this came to no fruition for them. I mean, there was never anybody came forward and said, I know who those people are. As a, uh, the investigation continued, but also, I think as things dried up for them, they were stopping cars and asking if they had seen anything. Did they turn anything up? Uh, no. And as far as we know, nothing came out of the, the trolling. The FBI released photos of the collar and the locking mechanism, which they removed from Brian's corpse. But I will at least uh, show a picture of the mechanism that was affixed around the neck of the victim. We are hopeful that 
someone or may recognize the instrument, the metal, the locking material that's used to secure it to the, uh, to the neck, and certainly call us with that information. And then I will show the locking device that was protruding from the front throat area. These were the best pieces of material evidence and the best clues the FBI had. A sequence of four locks and also a dial combination lock. We got a tip off that the FBI evidence team went over to a garage on the west side of Erie to investigate, see if there was anything from within this garage that might have helped go into building the device itself. The man who lived there was Jimmy Johnson, a metal worker who'd fathered a child with a woman who knew Brian Wells. The FBI interrogated Jimmy in public, on his own porch. They also interviewed Jimmy's last boss at his factory. Denny, I understand that uh, Jimmy Johnson used to work for you, is that right? Yes, he worked here for about two years. Yeah, was he a good worker? He was a great worker. What did the FBI do when they came to see you? Well, the first thing they did was show us a bunch of uh, pictures of what was left of the bomb. And they asked us, did we think that Jimmy Johnson could, could build that bomb? We said, yes, but also a lot of people could do that. Uh, so then they asked us if we thought he built the bomb, and we, we chuckled. We said, no, we don't think he did. And then they were laying out the plot of what they thought happened in this, and we also said, it just doesn't sound like he would, he would do such a thing. Did the FBI find anything that tied Jimmy Johnson to the bomb? Well, the one thing they found was plexiglass, and uh, they came in and took a piece of it. This, this is an example of the plexiglass that was really on the front shield of that bomb. And they were convinced that the, the piece of plexiglass that was on that bomb came from a sheet that was in this building. Did they seem very suspicious of Johnson? Did they think he'd done it? Uh, they told us they were quite convinced that he did it. They really thought they had honed in on, on their guy. But the FBI was wrong and soon dropped Jimmy as a suspect. Erie is an industrial town, and the truth is, plenty of locals had the skills to make a bomb. What can you tell me now we're looking at the locking mechanism about the standards of the workmanship? Any clues in there? Well, this was made by, I would say, an unskilled person, first of all. The, the forming of the metal is erratic. It looks like it was cut with possibly a hand hacksaw or maybe a small bandsaw. The drilled holes are not in line or uniform. It looks like the screwdriver was the wrong size or there was over torque. In Erie, are there many people who could do this? There are many people who could do something like this. Uh, a simple fabrication like this could be done, you know, in someone's garage with a vise, with a with a couple basic hand tools. Workmanship like this would not come out of a machine shop. But it did work, and after more than two years, the FBI and police still can't say who made it. Erie, Pennsylvania is a quiet town. It doesn't get a lot of murders. And TV news cameraman Dan Holland couldn't imagine what he was about to see when he arrived at the scene. You know, I, I got there and the call came out that this was a guy with a, a bomb around his neck and he had just robbed a bank. Well, the whole time I thought, this was a guy who intentionally did that, and he was so calm sitting there. It was, it was strange. How do you feel about seeing it now? It still gives me chills. It does. I mean, it's you... like watching an execution. Yeah. But by playing the tape back and forth, we realized that Brian Wells had been pleading with the police, telling them that he had only moments to live. Why isn't anyone trying to get this thing off? Oh. He knew he, he I didn't. I don't have a lot of time. Yeah. He pulled the pin out and started a timer. It's going to go off. I'm not lying. Call my boss. Yeah, and then... Boom. If this was an execution, 
What sort of psychopath would have wanted to murder Brian? If this was a bank robbery, why not just take the money and run? If this was a sadistic game played out in public, who could have dreamed up its twisted plot? I need to find out more about Brian's last journey and what the police are keeping to themselves. A first piece of the puzzle. Who did Brian encounter when he went to deliver his pizzas? Who was waiting for him in the woods? I found out that the FBI had let slip that Brian had run for his life. Nobody knew this at the time, but when I, when I was talking to the uh, field agents and when, when he was telling us the, the, the story, he said that, you know, about what had happened, what, what uh, uh, Brian Wells was telling the police while he was handcuffed in the parking lot, that when he came up here to deliver the pizza, he had tried to resist the abductors by running the, down the driveway to leave, but that somebody had shot at him, um, kind of like a warning shot over his head, and that he then, he froze, he panicked, he froze, and, and um, they came then finally and grabbed him and then outfitted him with the collar. He said, listen, I tried to get away, and these guys shot at me. Right. So the FBI knew that Brian wasn't part of the plot, that there were people waiting in the woods for him to trap him as a pawn in a bizarre game. Brian's next stop was the PNC Bank. The bank's employees and customers have been told not to talk about what happened the day Brian showed up. One customer, however, is willing to tell me what he saw. This man walks into the bank and he had this uh, uh, thing under his uh, sweatshirt uh, that looked like a shoebox. And uh, I'm looking at him, I couldn't figure out why he had that box, in, but he walks over to the teller and he tells, uh, uh, t gives the teller a white envelope. To me, he looked like he was, well, he was sort of scared. The FBI recently released these security camera stills of Brian in the bank. He seems unaware of everyone around him, more frightened man than hardened crook. He had his eyes focused right on the teller, and uh, he didn't pay any attention to us. I mean, we walked right past him, and he didn't even, he didn't bat an eye. Didn't it seem odd to you that you were able to walk out of a bank during a bank robbery? Yeah, that was, that was, that was amazing. I mean, just to understand why, why that was happening. So this wasn't a professional job in your opinion? No, it wasn't. It was, uh, it was something that, I mean, that I don't, I think it was his first time too. If this was just a robbery, why was it so elaborate? The FBI's former deputy director of counterterrorism now teaches in Erie. I asked him what he makes of the crime. Bomb's very sexy. It's very sexy. First of all, not everybody can make a bomb, but it works. Uh, and uh, it, uh, when you use a bomb, there's an association with terrorism. And nothing draws the media more than terrorism and a bomb. And this wasn't any old bomb either, was it? I mean, it had four locks to it, plus a combination, some sort of switching mechanism, possibly mm. a timer. Some would say overly, overly sophisticated. But the key was that it functioned. So then I asked John Heibel what he made of all the instructions, the hunt for the keys that Brian was supposed to follow. The idea of giving someone a mission uh, in which their life depended upon them to meet certain requirements uh, the, to the perpetrator in this case, I believe. The chance uh, to play God. Right, exactly. Uh, whether or not the person could have done it in the time that they were allotted is a question in my mind. Everything I read says that uh, there was not enough time for him to meet the requirements. Does that mean, do you think that by killing the victim, they would be able to cover their tracks. It's a, I think that's a good theory, is that they really had no intention of him surviving because he was the witness against them. It's logical that you would destroy the witness against you. And here they had a, a way of doing it in such a, such a manner that it, it's become an international incident.
They didn't get the money. No, but they got away with the crime, a crime. So it wasn't really a bank robbery, was it? Just a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Yeah. I think that's a good scenario. I decided to see if Brian could have finished the course, so I tried it myself. If Brian had survived, his first task would have been to go south on Peach Street and turn onto the 90 west, drive down to an interchange with the 79 north, and then he had to look for a uh, traffic light warning sign by an off-ramp. The clock is still ticking. Let's see if he could have made it. Imagine, this is a man who's supposed to have got round this course with a bomb around his neck with a timer. Any minute now he's going to blow up. Whoever did this was one sick puppy dog. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is. Right, instructions. Go directly across the grass to the right and into the woods. The container with the orange tape as your next instructions. So, by now, Brian has just picked up part of the combination of the lock around his neck or one of the four keys to the other locks around his neck. He's got at least two more to go. Right, now the FBI have held back the rest of the clues, but they've released because of sight, so we know where they are. Okay. Brian's been going about eight and a half, nine minutes. Got to find the McKean Township line. Come on, Brian. So this is the McKean Township sign, where Brian had to go out and collect another key. Get that collar off. Tick tock, tick tock. So, right by the side of the freeway, Brian is forced to scrabble, pick up another key. Now he's got to make his last stop. Got to go west on the 90. We know the bomb gave him 20 plus minutes. It's going to be tight. Poor Brian. He's already dead by now, but this would have, heart attack would have killed him on this trip, let alone the bomb. This is the last stop for Brian if he'd made it this far. This was the point at which he was supposed to get his final key and the last part of the combination lock which would stop the bomb from going off. about 20 minutes, the course. It's a little bit more than 20 minutes, perhaps. So he could conceivably have made it around this course and left the money, disabled the bomb around his neck. But that all assumes that there are no police in this country, least of all police interested in stopping a bank robber. Somebody must have been watching Brian Wells. Somebody enjoyed watching Brian Wells literally run for his life and then die. Right now, live from the historic Boston store in the heart of downtown, it's sunny and beautiful. We have 84 degrees. Would you like some coffee? Yes, please. Thanks. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you very much. How'd you like your eggs? Over easy, please. Toast? Yeah. Okay, thank Listen, you. Thanks a lot. Erie, Pennsylvania is as American as apple pie and as strange as only America can be. Just how odd emerged three weeks after Brian... State investigators looking into the bombing death of Brian Wells crossed the line into this latest murder investigation. They conducted a search of the property where the man's body was found in a deep freeze. So what connection, if any, is there between the death of Brian Wells and the body in deep freeze? Lou Baxter, Action News 24. Brian Wells delivered his two pizzas down this road on August the 28th. 
And for the next 23 days, FBI and other police gumshoes were marching up and down here searching for clues. Now, had it occurred to them to pop next door to the home of William Rothstein, and that had they got a search warrant, they would have found a body in a freezer in a thing that was right here. The guy who hid the body was a local handyman and part-time high school teacher, William Rothstein. What happened was he had turned himself into the police department, um, admitting that there was a body in his freezer. And then he implicated Marjorie Deal Armstrong. She killed James Roden, who at the time was her boyfriend. What we found out later on is that Rothstein had helped cover up the murder by disposing of the body and by redoing the bedroom where the place. Basically, James Roden was in a garage. This is the freezer, and this is James Roden's frozen corpse in plastic bags. The local cops put on a brave face. We were notified by the state police, Pennsylvania State Police, that they had uh, a Mr. Rothstein at their office, and he was admitting to uh, Mr. Roden being deceased and in a freezer at his house. Dean suddenly walk into the cops and say, there's a, there's a dead guy in my fridge. Mr. Rothstein explained that when it came right down to the moments before they were actually supposed to uh, dispose of the body, he could not go through with it and uh, decided uh, to notify authorities. What were they going to do to the body that was so gross? They were, since the, Mr. Roden's body was frozen, uh, one thought was to chop up the body into pieces and use a uh, ice grinder or chopper to uh, further dispose of the body. So these must be prime suspects in the murder of Brian Wells. Did you ask any of these characters whether they knew anything about the Brian Wells killing? Naturally, because of the close proximity of the Wells case uh, to Mr. Rothstein, and since uh, we are interviewing people associated with Rothstein, naturally we're going to throw out a question or two. Do you know anything? Have you heard anything about uh, this well, the Wells case? During those interviews, we did not get any information that either person had any information for. Marjorie is clearly an unusual person. When the police searched her house, they wore masks and special suits to fight off the fleas and odor of feces. The local TV presenter was pretty appalled too. This is the house. Mm. Looks more like the inside of a dumpster. What was it like for you to go in there? You almost didn't even know what to expect because when you stood outside, it, it just smelled so bad. From the, the outside, on the street. And so going in there was just, we actually bought masks and we went in with masks um, and you couldn't move. We were stepping on, on doors on the ground. We were stepping over things. There was just no way. Just piles and piles of clothing. Oh, yeah, that's, both. That's, that's the, um... That's the loot. <laughs> In addition to being a poor houseer and killing her lover, Marjorie had form. Did Marjorie Deal have a history of violence? I was aware of, uh, at least one other incident in which she was, uh, she had a trial for killing an old boyfriend years ago. And that's less than half the story. How many uh, husbands of Marjorie met with an, an abrupt end? Uh, to count whether it's husbands or boyfriends or related to her, there's four dead now. Four men in her life are, are gone. Whether it was or by her justified homicide or, and in the Roden case, convicted of murder. So she killed two? She killed two. We know of, and the other two Died. Died, correct. One, one committed suicide and the other one 
uh, perished after falling down the stairs. Probably no one in Erie knows more about Marjorie's trial for killing her first lover 17 years ago than the district attorney, Brad Falk. She had been charged in the late 1980s with murdering her paramour while he slept by shooting him, I think, six or seven times um, with a handgun. You say she was charged. Was she not convicted? No, she was found not guilty during a, um, or after a jury trial. What was her defense? I mean, had she indeed actually shot the guy? Well, there was no question. She, had, she admitted that, that she had shot the fellow while he slept on the sofa, and the jury found her uh, not guilty. I, w I would add, she had to reload, too. Uh, she, the pistol reloaded, shot him again, and 12 people thought that she was a battered woman. Did you prosecute that case? Absolutely not. Would you have won it if you had? Had, had, had I prosecuted it, this would have never happened a second time. This being a small town, it came as no surprise that Marjorie and Brad had been at high school together. She was a, a very academic type person, much more academic than I. Uh, that's so too. She thought she was brighter than everyone else. And it's a tragedy and it's a travesty on being railroaded, but the truth's gonna come out in court. So when Marjorie was brought in for killing James Roden, she had a few choice words for her old classmate. What did she say when you booked her? She told the state trooper she wasn't real concerned because that, in her opinion, uh, I wasn't real bright and she probably wouldn't be convicted. So there was an element of gamesmanship in her attitude. This was a bit of a challenge. Things such to Marjorie. The more I learned, the less I understood. It seems that Rothstein, having grasped up Marjorie to the police and denied any knowledge about Brian Wells's murder, was soon helping the police search Marjorie's house. So who was Rothstein? What was he hiding? And what was his game with the cops? Was Rothstein cooperative with you? Um, quite cooperative. He was very, very... Uh, almost to a point that it surprised us. And not only cooperative, Rothstein cleared to the police in his first interview that he was confident enough to correct their spelling errors. Okay, anything you say can and will be used against you in court of law. There's a typo error there. Okay. Okay. Do you think that Rothstein wanted to tell the police how clever he'd been in disposing of this body and getting rid of the gun? That's a tough question. That's, you know, it's hard to speak for what somebody else's thought process is. If you end kind of the way it played out, I would say that that may have came to be a part of his uh, thought process. That there was some, there was an element of gamesmanship in it? Correct. These are police photographs of Rothstein's garage. Aside from the corpse in the freezer, it was full of just the sort of junk needed to fashion a crude but effective collar bomb. So Rothstein did have some mechanical skills. He had quite a bit of mechanical skills. Now somebody might immediately point out what a bomb. If the question is, do I think that Mr. Rothstein was capable of doing that from everything I learned about him through the course of the investigation, I would say yes. Whether he did or not, I don't know. And Bill Rossi is a filthy liar that's going to get sued. But just because you're weird and you kill your boyfriends and just because you melt down a murder weapon, it doesn't necessarily mean you're responsible for the sadistic game Bryles. The Shell gas station on Peach Street in Erie. It's about half a mile from Rothstein's house and the TV towers where Brian had the collar bomb put around his neck. The FBI says the call to order the pizzas was made from here. But after two years, it's still a mystery 
who made that call. Did um, William Rothstein come in here regularly? Yes, he did. To buy gas? Bought gasoline, came in for cookies, newspapers. Did he, then, did he then stay here? N outside. He'd sit in his car for an hour or so, have lunch. Read the paper? Read the paper. Then he was gone. Did he use the Occasionally, yes. Didn't it strike you as odd that he would use the phone when he lived just down the road himself? Mm, no, not really. I mean, a lot of customers use the payphone out there. After Brian Wells was killed, did he ever talk about that with any of you or your no. staff? Um, one of the cashiers had had a conversation with him, and he said he'd done a lot of things in his life, but he'd never killed anybody. I'm not sure I'd believe Rothstein, but he did pass a lie detector test. He's since died of cancer, so I went to see his lawyer. Did he ever talk the Brian Wells case through with you? I mean, well, happened, half of it happened on his doorstep. Well, if I had any idea or any concern that he was involved in the Brian Wells case or that he would have not passed the, the polygraph, I'd have never let him subject himself to a polygraph. Yes. Quite frankly, once the polygraph was done, it basically wasn't spoken about. Did he ever suggest to you that he may have known who did the Brian Wells? Never. Or that he knew Brian Wells? Never. Or that Marjorie might have been involved? Never. But Rothstein did have a skeleton in his closet. Years before, he'd helped another friend to dump a murder weapon. Isn't that weird? Honestly, it was, and I was very surprised to hear it. Um, I, I, I was surprised. Um, I know he was never charged with anything at that time. He was given immunity. But it's my understanding that he did help the gentleman dispose of a gun. That had been used in a murder? Correct. So back in the 70s, he helped somebody dispose of a gun that's used in a murder. 2003, he helped somebody dispose of a gun that's used in a murder. Uh, and he's got a dead guy in his fridge, and then a man at the end of his street gets a bomb put around his neck. It's a pretty spectacular coincidence. Of everything that's happened? Yeah. Absolutely. I Absolutely. Mean, if I were a policeman, I think I might start with your former client. Absolutely. I mean, let's be honest, I guess it's, it takes a different kind of person to be able to remove a body and stick it in a freezer. He wasn't a loony. I don't, I think he was sane. Let's assume that Rothstein is innocent of Brian's murder. Frame. American kids love video games in which characters have to race against time to stay alive. Brian Wells was singled out to go on a sadistic adventure for real. Failure to complete the game in time cost him his life. A year after Brian's murder, William Rothstein was on his deathbed. The FBI showed him photos of high school students and asked him to point out the ones he knew. I asked these kids if they thought other young people could have devised the game that killed Brian. When Brian Wells died, what was your first reaction? So I thought he was just, um, someone's gonna put a bomb on him, they are waiting in a car, said, go in, bring me the money, then I'll take it off. I didn't think it was that elaborate, you know? Like, he had to have been I don't know, there's a lot, lot more to it than the public knew. And then when all the rules and regulations of the game came out, did you think that this could be perpetrated by youngsters like yourselves? I mean, for us to kind of devise something like this, it would probably take a long time, yeah. you know? I mean, I don't really think kids our age are into that. If they thought originally that there was going to be no one hurt, then I guess it's not that horrible of a thing. If they knew, eh, but they still had a bomb around his neck, so it's still a, <laughs> it's bad right from there, so I don't really know, I mean... I mean, there's, there's good and bad to both situations, you know. I mean, it seems by reading those notes and stuff that they were willing to let him go yeah. free if he cooperated. Do you think whoever did this thought they were pretty smart? I think now they think they're even smarter than yeah. they did before they even and did even, You can even see it in the notes. He said, mm -hmm. we took time to work out mm -hmm. all these plans, so do it right or you'll die. Mm -hmm. Whoever did it, mm -hmm. think they they got away with it. Mm -hmm. kind of away with murder. Mm -hmm. But who got away with murder? Brian Wells' brother, John, has been struggling with competing theories since the day Brian died. He's particularly angered by the suggestion that still pops up 
that Brian himself might have been in on the plot. I know he wasn't a participant. That's not the way Brian was. And if he was going to be doing something like this, he wouldn't put a live mom on himself. He wouldn't lock it four different locking devices with no way of getting it off. He wouldn't inscribe things on the bomb if he was going to kill himself. John Wells also holds the police responsible for standing around for more than half an hour instead of immediately calling the bomb squad to get the bomb off Brian's neck. It might have saved his life. Are you saying that a state policeman, when told there's a man with a bomb, doesn't immediately call the bomb squad? No, they didn't. The state police didn't even call the bomb squad. The FBI, director of the FBI in Erie called the bomb squad at 3.04, 32 minutes after the first 911 call. How can you explain that? I can't explain it. I'd like the state to police, police to explain it. Even more galling for John is that he now knows the bomb's trigger was dirt simple. As far as what they told me, it was an egg timer. It was an egg timer was an egg that timer to blow your up. brother? Yes. Simple kitchen egg timer. And that went off after the 55 or 60 minutes, whatever they had it set up. So he didn't really stand much of a chance, you don't think? I, he was dead. As soon, as soon as they put that bomb, he was dead. It was just a matter of where and when. I asked John if he thought young video gamers could have been involved. I don't believe so. And the only reason I don't believe so is I don't believe you can get a group of teenagers to keep their mouth shut for two years. Somebody would have turned somebody in. I believe, anyway. How many people do you think were involved in this? I, I believe at least five. Do you think that Brian could have gotten around the course if he hadn't been intercepted? I think he probably got, or could have got around the course. I think he'd still be dead. I think he would have died at the last stop, and whoever wanted, you know, would have taken the bag of money and said, hey, we got money, we didn't expect this. We got you blown up and we got money, we're gone. Do you think it was really an attempt to rob a bank? No, I think this was just a, a, a murder, an, an elaborate murder, an, an, an elaborate public execution. It was about time I went to see the FBI. Bank robbery and bombings are federal offences. Is Brian Wells a suspect? Oh, as far as the FBI is concerned, we don't characterize anyone as a suspect or not a suspect. Our goal is to find out who made the device uh, that was placed on Brian Wells and then who was responsible for his death. Do you know what the explosive was? can't comment specifically on any of the components of the device. Obviously, that would hinder our investigation. It was stated that the bomb had fake wires and that the threats that there were um, booby traps were empty. Is that true? As far as the specifics of what each of the materials did or not, did not do, um, we're not going to comment on. So I then asked, what happened in the woods? How many people jumped, Brian? I uh, don't want to comment on the specific. You have that answered now, Pat, right? That's... <laughs> but it was a group of people, he said. I don't want to comment on that. I asked Bob Rudge if FBI agents talk to any high school kids or computer gamers. Your, your question was one that was certainly addressed, uh, but again, what credence we're able to give that particular scenario, I'm not at liberty to comment at, uh, upon. Do you think you're close to making an arrest? We're closer than we were two years ago. We're closer than we were a year ago. But um, to characterize an arrest being imminent certainly would uh, not be appropriate. Do you think Brian Wells was singled out? Difficult to say, I just don't know. How close are you to cracking this case? Oh, geez, I don't know. I hope close. Uh, it's been a long road for everybody. There is no doubt in my mind that it'll be solved. But to give you a timetable, uh, I'd, I'd like to say sooner rather than later. Was whoever did this having a bit of fun with the cops? and the law enforcement people. It's a hell of a way to have fun. Well, Erie hasn't given up her secrets to me. It's a very strange little town where a pizza delivery guy can get a bomb put around his neck, and right next door, 
a man is living with a dead person in his freezer. If it wasn't Rothstein, Marjorie and that lot, then whoever did it is still on the streets. And I, for one, am glad to be leaving. Banged Up Abroad is over on the Biography Channel next and tells the story of Mark Knowles, who swallowed half a kilo of cocaine in condoms and nearly died. Coming up next here tonight, though, young offenders take their prison guards hostage in standoff. <laughs>